You are my adversary, but you are not my enemy. For your resistance gives me strength. Your will gives me courage. Your spirit ennobles me. And though I aim to defeat you, should I succeed, I will not humiliate you. Instead, I will honor you. For without you, I am a lesser man. This is my world. Penrith Lakes was again centre stage on day nine. In the women's quadruple skulls, Great Britain's team were locked in battle with the Russians for second place. At the end, there was an agonising wait as a photo finish revealed that the British had snatched the silver medal by a mere one hundredth of a second. I honestly didn't care whether we had a silver or bronze, we had a medal and Britain had never won a medal before at the Olympic Games and we'd achieved our dream of medalling. Um, and it was, it was inspirational and, and I remember we then, we then sat there for 12 minutes while the guys with the little computers worked out on the video screens what the difference was and the difference was four centimetres over two kilometres, so over about a mile and a third. And there was an agonising wait as a photo finish revealed that the British had snapped. The difference was four centimetres. At the edge, the silver medal by a mere one hundredth of a second. The, the Olympics, as far as the satisfaction of standing on that medal podium and receiving that, and that's years and years of, of dedication, hard work, other people's commitment into it, is a huge, amazing thing. And the fact that the whole world is watching you makes the Olympics so special. The, that there was a very small group of people that had... It was me proving, which was very different to the Olympics, where it's about, you know, putting your name on the line of it. It was something I needed to do. It was something... Um, crossing the Channel. Crossing the Channel was very pro Proving that it could be done and, and then going for it. Um, well, Quinn Batten, much like uh, many of the rowers that I work with, is a fairly determined character. Uh, they need to be, I think, to, to do the sport of rowing. She is one of the more single-minded athletes that I've worked with and very much goal-orientated. And I think if anyone was going to complete a an effort which is what she's done across the channel then I think Gwyn is the type of character that's going to do that. In the winter of 2001 um, I, I trained through a virus. I had, I'd, I'd, had a, I'd had a flu and I thought that um, I'd recovered and in fact I was travelling out to Canada and I had, jet, I had jet lag and I just thought it was jet lag. I didn't realise I was still recovering from the virus, from the flu and I trained through it. And about two or three weeks later of hard training, I came to a grinding halt. In rowing, always training at a, at a level where they're, they're fairly depleted. So their reserves are going to be fairly low. And therefore, if you are starting to get some kind of viral problems in the lungs, you're going to just have repeated illnesses, repeated flus, repeated bronchitis. And I think this is eventually what, in Gwyn's case, was the limiting factor. 
I needed goals to keep me, you know, instead of just sitting at home and thinking, well, they're off to this and they should be, they should be racing the race now and how are they feeling? And, and, and I needed things to take my mind off the, the goals that I hadn't been able to achieve. Ivor had gone in a coastal boat, which was quite a, quite a wide boat, and I knew that if I could beat Ivor's time, I'd have to go in a quicker boat. And the quicker boat was a river skull, which is the same one that um, we race at the Olympic Games. It's, the same, it's about the same size as my backside, well, my backside before I retire. And that's it's very narrow um, and very, very unstable and very light, only weighs 14 kilos. And I knew that if I was going to beat Ivor Lloyd's record, I had to go in something quicker. And that was, that was very hard because nobody had actually gone in boats that narrow before. Um, and it was, you know, I, I sort of went around the rowing world, and about 50% of the people around the rowing world, my, my contemporaries, felt that you could do it. 50% felt that you couldn't. I went down to the coastal rowing world, and the guys, um, I didn't find a single coastal rower that said you could do it. So it was amazing to be, to, to be definitely... Have, have got a goal, but everyone else thinking that you couldn't do it. Um, you know, the, the, whole, the whole aspect about crossing, crossing the channel is very, very difficult in the organisational capacity because the channel is the busiest waterway in the world um, and you've got so much um, traffic coming through. They, they reckon it's about 500 vessels a day go through. So you can imagine, I mean, it's like a motorway, it's even got a central reservation. Um, and you can imagine that the um, Coast Guard aren't too happy about people trying to cross in their bathtubs and things like that. And um, so, you know, w we spent quite a bit of time trying to make sure we could get a slot. We actually were waiting for three months for the slot to cross in the context that we could only go if, the w if there was no wind. I got a telephone call and it said, um, You're, we're ready to go tomorrow morning. And I literally, it was two o'clock in the afternoon and I had to dash home and um, get all my kit and throw it into the back of my car and, uh, you know, half an hour to do everything in. And then that, that afternoon we drove down to Folkestone and put, managed to get a room in a hotel there. And then uh, I remember going to bed and um, I didn't sleep all night. I just lay there smiling, thinking that finally, at last, I was going to be able to have my chance of rowing across the channel. And yeah, I woke up about four o'clock and, and we went down to the, down to the harbour. Uh, it was pitch black, I was really, really scared because you can't see anything. I didn't even know how big the waves were outside the harbour. And I remember at about five o'clock, um, the um, chase boats went off and waited outside the harbour entrance and, and then put the boat on the water and, and rowed out and just sat there to wait for the light to come. I don't know why we waited for the light, but that seemed appropriate. And of course in rowing you can't see where you're going, so I didn't know what the waves were going to be like, and it was really scary. And, um, and we just started to pull away, and it was, it was all really surreal. It was something that, you know when you're so scared you have no control over, and you just do it, and somehow you just get through because you're thinking of the next thing. It's just everything is just my little bubble and I'll just do this and then this. And, um, and then gradually the sun started to come up and the light lifted and you could just get further and further away from land. And it's sort of like, oh no, I'm just leaving civilization. I'm heading into the black void of something that hasn't been done before. And, um, you know, as we got further and further away, it started, I was really quite enjoying it. It was, it was really hot because there was no wind. Um, and you know, we wanted to make sure we drank a lot. Um, but I was really worried that what would happen when we hit the washes from these great big tankers um, in, the, in the shipping lanes. You know, the, the waves, the front bit of the tanker is the size of, you know, it's the size of a room. And that's just the bow, the ball that pushes the wave. And how big is that wave going to be? And am I, are we going to be able to make it through between one tanker and the next tanker? You know, um, and it. it Amazingly enough, I remember going through the first big wash of the tanker, and it was like being on a roller coaster. We just went up and down. It was really calm, and I'm thinking, and I didn't even get a drop of water in my boat. I was thinking, why was I so worried? This is great fun. Um, 
We had to change course um, to make sure we didn't crash into one of these things because I don't think we registered on their radar. Um, and we, ha we had to move off. So we had used, the, um, we used the satellite navigation and um, radar to see, to see the boats and change course you know, quite a long way out from them. I think the closest we got to um, one of them was about 500 metres. Love, we're going to move you over again towards the other boat. Take your time, no panic. What we want to do is half the gap between the two boats. You know, it was three hours, 14. It was very satisfying, very satisfying moment. But it was quite surreal. We came into Cat Green A and I'm rowing in and this big, big what, big, the rollers are just coming in as they hit the shore and I'm coming in, I'm totally swamped. The whole of the boat swamped by this stage as I'm trying to put my foot down on French soil and I, I get there and I put my foot down and there's no soil and, I, uh, and there's no sand and so I row again and I put my foot down again and I touch sand and I stick my hand up in the air to stop the clock. The French authorities are very against people coming across the channel, you know, they don't want any invasion forces. So um, they, we were on the understanding that we would arrive on French soil and then we would leave. So we would actually came across and we actually went back um, on the fishing vessels that came with our chase boats. Um, we just basically put the, the boat, I put the boat back on the um, chase boat and motored back. It was quite interesting, you know, to actually beat the boys, you know, to beat, have a girls record, to beat the men's. I, was fi I find that quite entertaining. I quite like that idea. <laughs> I go round to the guys and I say, oh, you know, you should cross the channel. Men's record's really easy, you know. <laughs> Women's one, well, that's a different one altogether. <laughs> but I think, you know, I've got little ideas. I, I st no one's actually been round Antarctica yet. You know, there's always, I thought I'd do Isle of Wight and then Antarctica next, you know. That I like to dream. But if you don't dream, you, you don't achieve.